Hello geeks, this is me Ayub from a bonus video about distributed systems. In this video, I try to provide a concise overview about distributed systems and distributed computing as an extra video lesson to the architectural patterns series. So without further ado, let's dive in into the topic. First, let's explain and clarify what a distributed system is and what it's not. But before that, let me tell you something that you may not be aware of. Nearly all the software we use today is to an extent distributed or involved distributed computing. How? You're gonna know the answer in a bit. For now, let me just give you some examples. Distributed systems or distributed computing is all around us. Google search engine, Amazon platforms, Netflix, blockchain, online gaming, money transfer and online banking, and the list goes on. Probably the most straightforward and the simplest example of distributed systems is the client-server model, which I assume you are familiar with, and if not, you can check my short video about it. I'll go back to this model for the sake of demonstration later. For now, let's go back to the fundamental question and see what exactly a distributed system is. A distributed system is a collection of separate and independent software or hardware components called nodes that are linked together by means of a network and work together coherently by coordinating and communicating through message passing or events to fulfill one end goal. Nodes of the system could be unstructured or highly structured depending on the system requirements. In any case, the complexities of the system remain hidden to the end user, be it a human being or a computer, and the whole system appears as a single computer to its users. Alright, let me repeat with the written words now. A distributed system is a collection of separate and independent software or hardware components called nodes that are networked and work together coherently by coordinating and communicating through message passing or events to fulfill one and goal. Nodes could be unstructured or highly structured depending on the system requirements, and the complexities of the system are hidden to the end user, making the whole system appear as a single computer to its users. So basically, it's just a bunch of independent computers that cooperate to solve a problem together. I know it sounds simple, but it's a hell of a world under the hood. Before we continue though, I just want to say that two programs communicating with each other on the same computer is not necessarily a distributed system, even though they work together to achieve the same goal. A client server model that uses the same computer is not a distributed system. This is important to know. Of course, there is the exception of parallel multiprocessor computers, but for the sake of simplicity and clarity, let's not tackle complicated examples. That's because for a system to be called distributed as opposed to centralized or parallel, the following conditions need to be true. First, no shared clock. Computers have clocks, also called timers, which are critical electronic devices that keep track of oscillations and they help the computer to have its own notion of time. This in turn helps to determine the order between events and regulates the time and speed of the computer operations. If two programs communicate using the same computer, they basically have the same clock. This leads us to another requirement for distributed systems, which is that each element in this system has to have its own processor, and harmony is achieved through coordination and synchronization. The second principle is no shared memory. This is another key feature of distributed systems. This means nearly each each process has its own independent memory to work with and state is distributed throughout the system. Concurrency is another important characteristic of distributed systems, which means that software and the hardware components of the system, also called processes, are autonomous and execute tasks concurrently. And last but not least, heterogeneity and loose coupling, which means the processors are independent and separate from each other and they have different speeds. Even though heterogeneity and loose coupling are not necessary, almost invariably nodes in distributed systems run different operating systems, and components can be built with different technologies and run on different platforms. Before moving on to basic concepts about distributed computing, I just want to mention a couple of notes. First, a distributed system is a dynamic system that allows computers or or nodes to join and leave at will. This has many advantages as we'll see later, but also it introduces some challenges and overheads such as in case of open distributed systems, security issues and the extra work of managing the organization and membership of nodes. The second thing I want to say is that nearly all existing large distributed systems, especially modern ones, are overlay networks. What in the universe is an overlay network? An overlay network is a virtual network that was possible to build thanks to an underlying network 
network infrastructure. Put simply, a non-relay network is just a network on top of another network. For instance, peer-to-peer -peer networks such as blockchain and BitTorrents are overlay networks. That is to say, they are networks on top of the internet. Voice over IP is another network over the internet, so it's also called an overlay network. Okay, I hope by now you have a fair idea about what a distributed system is and can tell whether a system is distributed or not. Good. Now let's talk about some important basic concepts about distributed computing. Okay, so distributed computing is a type of computing over distributed systems, right? So this means that distributed computing is more than distributed systems. It's a broader term and it is concerned with building and establishing computing models for distributed systems and working out algorithms to solve problems related to such systems. Cloud computing is a good modern example of distributed computing. Other examples of distributed computing solutions are platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, serverless, etc. Now, we will keep things simple and talk only about basic distributed computing concepts. Alright, so one of the very basic concepts that you should know about is the notion of a node. A node is a software or hardware component that has its own processor and memory and is able to communicate with the rest of the system. Nodes form open groups, that is to say a network of nodes that is open to the external world and thus joining the network is easy, and also external entities can communicate with the system easily. The internet is one big giant distributed system that falls under this category. Nodes can also form closed groups, which are restricted in terms of membership, authentication, and resource accessibility. Intranets are an example of that. Of course, nodes can communicate via messaging mechanisms such as RPC calls, REST services, etc. Another important notion is what is referred to as a resource. A resource is an asset in the distributed system that could be accessed remotely by nodes in the network or users of the distributed applications that run over the distributed system. Resources can be virtually anything, such as files, services, storage facilities, other networks, etc. Basically, a resource is anything that a node can take advantage of or use. Distribution transparency is another important concept, which denotes that everything that happens under the hood should stay invisible to the end users of the system. In other words, the dispersion of resources, the failure of nodes and failovers, migration and replication operations, etc., all should be invisible to users of the system. The way to achieve this is through an important component called the middleware. And speaking of which, a middleware in this context is a distributed systems layer that connects the nodes together and makes them appear as one single supercomputer. It is a logical layer on top of the whole system. Think of it as an operating system that runs over the nodes collectively. Once this layer is established, distributed applications could be built and run over it. This middleware layer manages resources, provides communication and security services, handles failures and the other complexities of distributed computing, etc. Next is concurrency. We have talked about this concept before in the characteristics. In simple words, concurrency is the fact that multiple operations and activities are executed in parallel. These activities can interact among each other to perform a particular operation. In this diagram, for example, a simple distributed program is visualized. We could see that in phase 1, task 1 and 2 are executed in parallel and there is a simple interaction between them. Phase 2 has three operations in parallel and one cooperation between two of them. And as we saw earlier, concurrency is an intrinsic property of distributed systems. Alright, coordination and synchronization. These are two important concepts that tackle the problems of no shared clock between processes. And also they solve the problem of data corruption and inconsistency if two entities try to access data at the same time. Coordination ensures the smooth collaboration between operations and activities and help achieve agreement among them. Synchronization, on the other hand, orders and controls access to shared resources. The next concept is the architectural model. The architectural model dictates how the nodes in the system are organized. It defines the structure of the network as well as how nodes communicate and interact. The architectural model is extremely important in distributed computing for the sake of better management of the complexities of such systems and also for ease of maintenance. Mainly, the architecture is needed for software components, and that's because, as we said earlier, most distributed systems are overlay networks. The last concept I want to talk about is global state. Global state in distributed systems is the union of the states of the separate processes. It is sort of a global view of the system that describes its properties at a particular point in time. It's sort of the equivalent of a global object that contains all the global variables used by the software system. Now, why not use one single supercomputer that could do everything we want and save ourselves the trouble? 
Why use instead of that several computers and add the overhead of managing and maintaining them? That's actually a good question. And the answer is that the motives to use a distributed system instead of a single computer are many. One of the most common ones is the need for a solution where we need to reach a consensus among parties that are dispersed geographically. Examples of such cases are online banking, blockchain, bidding platforms, etc. Resource sharing is another reason why we need distributed systems such as databases or distributed file systems. Another example that falls under the same reason are peer-to-peer -peer systems like the BitTorrent network, etc. Another case where we need a distributed system is when we cannot or it's inefficient to replicate data using one computer. Also, when scalability is of crucial importance, a distributed system is probably the optimal solution. Of course, there are other reasons why one would choose a distributed system such as availability, reliability, etc. So these are the main reasons why one would prefer to go for a distributed system. Related to the motives for using such systems are the advantages of distributed computing. But before talking about the advantages and challenges of distributed systems, let's briefly talk about their types. When talking about types of distributed systems or any kind of systems, it's important to understand that classification depends on the context and on the level of complexity we're taking into account. Are we talking about architecture? Are we classifying the system based on the end goal? Is the context related to the topology? Is it related to how coupled the nodes are, etc.? In this section, I'm going to address two types of classification. The first is general and related to the type of coupling and scale, and the second is related to the architectural model of the whole system. When talking about distributed systems in terms of scale, there are two main types of distributed computing, cluster computing and grid computing. In cluster computing systems, the underlying infrastructure is composed of identical computers that are closely connected and the management is local and centralized. Cluster computing is used to achieve high performance and minimize downtime. Grid computing, on the other hand, is a type of systems in which heterogeneity is the norm in terms of hardware, software, and technology. Nodes are dispersed over a very large area and administration is decentralized. Such systems are used when a large repository of data is involved and a lot of computing power is required. All right, and if we're talking about architecture styles, on the other hand, distributed systems fall under one of the following categories. First, layered architecture. In this architectural model, nodes are grouped into separate layers, each with a specific goal to achieve. An example of a simple layered distributed system is the client-server model. Next, the object-based architecture. Nodes in such systems are less structured and loosely coupled than the layered model. Communication is asynchronous and the elements of the system can directly interact with other elements through direct calls. The third architectural model is the data-centered architecture. In such systems, nodes communicate through a common repository. The system is based on a data center through which primary communication has Happens. And the last one, which is a more common one, is the event-driven architectural model. Event-driven systems achieve their goals by means of events. Nodes communicate and perform operations through the propagation of and the reaction to events. Feel free to check my video about the event-driven architectural pattern to know more. So these are the main architectural styles for distributed systems in a nutshell. All right, let's talk now about the pros and cons of distributed computing. As always, let's start with the advantages. The first advantage I wanna talk about is reliability. A defining characteristic of distributed systems is the reliable interconnection and cooperation between nodes in the whole system. This makes it easy to share data between nodes. Another great advantage is scalability. In fact, this is one of the main reasons as to why someone or an organization would opt for a distributed system. In distributed computing, scalability is is a matter of adding more nodes to the system at the corresponding layer or level, or what is referred to as horizontal scaling. Another common advantage is fault tolerance. It means the system and its services will still be operational and reliable even when parts of the system goes down. Of course, as we said before, resource sharing becomes not only possible but also easy in such systems. And last but not least, increased performance. But as all matters of life, distributed systems are not a silver bullet. And actually talking about the downsides of distributed computing is a separate topic in itself. First, failure detection. Failure detection is almost impossible in distributed systems, especially if the system is large and evolves over time. Very elaborate measures need to be taken to mitigate risks of this issue. Redundancy is a common issue among distributed systems as well. Another challenge or problem is the difficulty to achieve consistency among nodes. And finally, performance bottlenecks is a serious issue as well. 
Actually, when it comes to distributed systems, the more we design for failure, any kind of failure at all levels, the less problems we will have. This leads us to the final section, issues and considerations. Of the most important pitfalls when building distributed systems is the false assumptions made by developers such as the network is reliable and secure, or the topology of the underlying network doesn't change, or that latency is zero. This leads to a poor and fragile system that breaks easily. And actually, one of the crucial principles developers and architects abide by when designing and developing distributed systems is the design for failure principle. Under this rule, there are a lot of considerations to take into account. But generally speaking, design for failure is expecting the worst case scenario in each and every aspect when the system is operational and plan for that. Alright, this should be enough for a brief overview of distributed systems. The last thing I want to say is that unlike distributed systems, nodes in a network are explicitly visible and have to be explicitly addressed. Also, a network in itself doesn't have to have a specific end goal and it's usually not robust and secure as a distributed system. That's the difference between a distributed system and a network. Alright, I hope you've enjoyed this video and learned something new. Don't forget to subscribe. Until the next video, stay tuned.